Hi, everyone. Welcome to live chat with the um, creators of Bug Snacks, um, one of the my favorite games that I've gotten a hold of recently. Um, so I'm super excited to be able to do this. Um, and we get to do Q&A from the audience later in this session. I'm really excited about that as well. Um, Hi, my name is Adam Salzman. Uh, I'm the co-founder and director uh, here at Finji. Uh, I'm in our offices, which I'm the only one here because um, we're all still in the middle of that thing. Uh, we're a developer and publisher. We've worked on games like Overland, Night in the Woods, and Chicory. And I've been on the GDC advisory board for about 10 years or something now. So I'm just pumped to be here and talk to these gentlemen, the first of which is Kevin Zoon from Young Horses. Hi, I'm Kevin Zoon. Thanks for having me here. Uh, as said, I'm the creative director at Young Horses on uh, Octodad Deadliest Catch and Bug Snacks. Uh, my primary responsibilities day-to-day uh, -day include level design, quest design, and writing, and on rare lucky occasions, some small art. Uh, I work pretty closely with my colleague, John, who will introduce himself now. Uh Hi, I'm John Murphy. Um, I am one of the co-founders and the studio head at Young Horses. We're an independent studio based in Chicago. And I'm here because for Bug Snacks, I uh, did a lot of the sort of like systems and gameplay design, designing Bug Snacks and the, the tools and traps you use to capture them and feed them to your friends. <laughs> Uh, and this is great because um, this is, I think what I wanted to talk about most for this game is how the gameplay and the story are connected. Because I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of developers struggle with, either coming from a story background, how do I do gameplay stuff if we're coming from a gameplay background? Oh no, how, much, how do we you know, get a story in here? And in Bug Snacks, these things are married in a way that's really beautiful and often disturbing. Um, so... Uh, uh, also, yeah, another reminder, there's a questions tab down there in the swap card app in the chat section. Um, you can ask questions and chat moderators can help get those things queued up. And we're going to save time at the end of this to uh, answer those questions, uh, which I'm looking forward to very much. Um, so, but I wanted to start with a question kind of about the early days and about the earliest stages of this project, which is a project that you guys have been working on for a very pretty, pretty long time uh, in game making terms. Um, <laughs> So Bug Snacks, in many ways, I think is a game about people who are trying to solve uncomfortable internal problems with comfortable external solutions. Um, and it started out like most games, which is a clone of Pokemon Snap, but you can eat all the Pokemon. Um, so I was curious if you could share some of the early turning, like early turning points for the system design, um, and also some of the early kind of hooks for how story might be connected to those things. Um, and whoever wants to start is totally fine with me. Uh, Zoon, why don't you start? You have a, you've been uh, looking back through the archives. You have a little bit of a better uh, memory of the progression of these various early prototypes. Uh, that's true. I, I made it my mission early on to just keep a record of every like kind of major phase of the project. And I have builds on my computer of like old versions of bug snacks. Uh, and you're right, Adam, that the, the very beginning, it was uh, a Pokemon Snap like it was on rails. Uh, you threw your traps out into the world to catch bug snacks while being in no control of yourself. Uh, and you would bring them back to the town, uh, which would be later named Snacksburg, in order to feed them to these Grumpuses. Uh, and John, you can speak more on the actual systems at play when that happened. But uh, even like from the earliest pitches of the game, we knew bug snacks were parasites and that they were very bad for you and that you should not eat them. <laughs> and if I were going to summarize kind of a lot of the development of the narrative and systems behind the game, it would be knowing that bug snacks are bad for you and everyone wants them is kind of the driving force of all the themes in the game. Hmm. Yeah, so, and uh, we needed to figure out like kind of like what happened after you you fed Grumpuses. Like early prototypes uh, were kind of like you're in this food truck, you go back to this town, you feed bug snacks, and then why? What happens? So 
one early prototype that didn't really answer the why, but was was fun was um, just uh, you feed a, a grumpus a bug snack and their nose turns into a pickle or something. It's like okay, that's that's sort of there's something fundamentally nice about that, but we had not yet like tied that to to any narrative stuff. And then um, separate from that, there there was an early prototype uh, where this town, you're trying to get the town to sort of like the townsfolk to work together and to sort of build up the town. And so I'm kind of obsessed with um, both like personality and human interactions and also with um, uh, sim building simulations. So we had tried to do a, a, an early an early idea of mm -hmm. okay, the different bug snacks will change different aspects of of the Grumpus's personalities, and different personalities will get to get along differently. So it's like, oh, we're going to feed this this person a bunch of, of uh, bananas, and this person a bunch of pickles, and then they will collaborate better to be able to. I don't know, build the town hall. John, I would love to chime in on the specifics of the personality system. Oh yes, please just, do. Just to note that like at the time we had decided that it would be best if the personality traits had no bearing on the real world. And so the personalities the Grumpus has had that interacted were things like gormless, flatulent, ticklish. <laughs> um just like nonsense. And it's like, hey, ticklish people get along really well with gormless people. That's how it works. That sounds um, super fun to try to surface through UI in order to like engage the player. That must have been a super smooth and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of, oh yeah, everything was super transparent and uh, and yeah. everyone understood everything that was happening in this for, in this rough prototype. Yeah, <laughs> for, for for anybody who's following along with the subtitles or other languages, we're being profoundly sarcastic right now. This is a <laughs> this is a, a nightmare scenario for a uh, game developer. Adam, <laughs> one of the. Uh, one of those early prototypes we were talking about had a uh, an indicator where if you clicked on an individual Grumpus like node because they were just sort of running around as little circles, it would show you their connection to every other Grumpus in town mm -hmm. and whether they disliked or liked them. So it just like opened a spider web of relationships <laughs> that was impossible to read. <laughs> yeah, great, great, awesome. Um, uh, it, it, so it sounds like, like, uh, I think it's funny that you guys landed on the idea of like, um, the, uh, they have snacks, they get physically transformed because I think even though the personalities and simulations components, um, didn't move forward for, um, possibly in retrospect, obvious reasons, um, <laughs> yeah, but kind yeah. of the, the idea, I think it's funny that like coming from an initial idea of these things are bad, it was the funny but kind of horrifying idea of physical transformation that really stuck. Um, but then you had to compensate, I guess you had to find um, other things to go. And actually my, my original follow-up question was pretty specifically like, um, it, I think it's interesting that uh, in a lot of ways, the, um, the transformation of the bug snacks ended up being uh, something that was used narratively a lot and actually isn't used in terms of giving people stats. And I feel like that's the normal place you would go with the design. And it sounds like that is also where you started. Like, oh, strawberries give you plus four uh, gormless or something. Um, and so that's how their gameplay meaningful. But in fact, it's actually, it's really meaningful that um, they have a, a pickle for a nose. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that is an interesting point that... Um we had started with a much more systematized understanding of Bugsnack's effect on the characters. And one of the reasons that we moved away from it, in addition to it being kind of a, a snarl of UI, was also that um, like it felt very distant and manipulative to um, work on the characters in such a statistical way. And uh, in answering the question, why you care about this, like, why do you care about these creatures and what's happening to their town? Um, it gets harder to answer that question in a meaningful way when you see them as objects that can be just sort of changed to your liking. Uh, and so al almost 
on accident, because almost everything we do is on accident, we find that it's more meaningful in this case uh, for a narrative reason to accept that the bug snacks are not useful in a mechanical way, if that makes sense, but that they have meaning to them uh, in terms of their desires and their personalities. Um, and especially as it evolves in the story that uh, bug snacks are not great for you, the fact that they're also useless to you is important. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, and how how early would you say that was? So you've got you've gotten from okay, um, like are you still in a food truck? Are you still kind of Pokemon snapping around collecting things at this point? Uh, if you're talking about that version with the uh, like town manipulation. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. or figuring out like, so there's a point where you figured out like, oh, um, the player is a, uh, this godlike scientist who is <laughs> single-handedly transforming all the people in the town in a cold and manipulative way. And actually we're not into that. Um, I'm curious where systems were at at that point too. Um, so it, uh, our idea back at the time, uh, was that it was kind of a, uh, there was a core loop where you would go out in your food truck to catch the bug snacks uh, in the Pokemon Snap first person uh, rails game. And you would bring them back to the town to do your feeding uh, and your attempt to get them to cooperate. We had also, uh, and John, feel free to chime in on this, had a separate side system where you would uh, peel bug snacks apart in order to make them more edible uh, as like a physics toy that was deeply horrifying. <laughs> Yeah, so in a, in addition to deciding that having the systemic manipulation be directed at the, the grumpuses and how that made it harder to see them as characters that you care about, even though we're capturing and feeding, even though the bug snacks are, are parasites and you're feeding them to, to these grumpuses, the... The, the the ripping them apart uh was was also too too far <laughs> uh, yes it did it, it definitely came off as sadistic and uh upsetting to do even if that's like how making food exists in this world it didn't come off right uh yeah it's, it's, it seems like a kind of a fine line or a balancing act almost uh, cause I feel like if you want to like, uh, I think, I, I guess this is, this is a tricky thing that I'm probably going to be poking at throughout this, but, um, uh, I think it's a, it's a game about, um, things that are kind of uncomfortable, but you do want people to sit and play it and have fun. So like, how do you walk that tightrope? I think is, is a, a tricky question. I mean, all, all the time and, and especially here. So yeah, like devouring bug snacks, having your body transformed in horrible and surprising ways. Great. Uh, but peeling <laughs> apart the bug snacks, oh, that's that's over the line. I think that's an interesting balance. Uh, was that feedback? Was that just internal guidance? Was that, I'm curious, like uh, how you guys navigated some of that balance? Um. It was definitely uh, internal at that point because uh, to answer like the when of this, like we spent about a good year, the first year of the project building this particular version of Bug Snacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was about at that year mark that we kind of took stock of what it was and what we were dissatisfied with uh, and like started making major changes. Like I don't think we had necessarily shown it to very many people outside of ourselves at that point. Um, not until it had become a, a lot more like the game it is today. Uh, but like for sure, uh, like finding that line was a part of that development process. And, you know, at the time discovered that swallowing them whole, fine. <laughs> no one has a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, it, there was a, a very interesting uh, result from doing that also is that um, we had not allowed the bug snacks to be cute at the time, particularly. Mm -hmm. They were actually very scary and upsetting looking as well because they were much more bug-like back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and in part, that was um, 
like a reaction to the fact that they were prepared like food uh that the cuter they are the worse that system becomes to interact with <laughs> right you've got pressure there automatically kind of from uh i assume like from a player but also as someone who would have to sit and work on the game for a long time it's like oh where this is where you do the horrible thing to the horrible creatures um we definitely can't make these creatures then cute um but i uh, uh, i guess like so now if you don't have to peel them apart piece by piece <laughs> and like uh, masticate them in detail, um, now that's kind of maybe that's opened some doors design wise for like, oh, we can actually we can do some other stuff with these creatures now. Yeah. I, and, and because, you know, one of our goals is to make games that are, you know, both ex accessible and like charming having a, a banana with like realistic looking grasshopper legs that you're pulling off is is uh <laughs> it's not that <laughs> that's fair um but john it was i think it was you who insisted that they all have googly eyes oh yeah that was a, that was definitely a uh yeah that that, that, that was a thing that i uh, felt strongly about that it was it was a there was a bit of a fight uh, it, it was a bit of a fight but it's retroactively a great choice uh, i of course agree <laughs> <laughs> the um finding the little um dish out in one of the uh in the the little um laboratory on the beach that's just full of extra eyes is, um really ended up being for all the all the upsetting things that were removed from this game I think <laughs> leaving that one in i found very very upsetting um yeah. so i was curious too i think one of the things that um uh one of the things that ends up being or was very memorable for me at least about the game is the um so it, i guess it was it was the, this quest system of going out and finding all the people and bringing them together to make a village it's not a pre-existing place that you're just tweaking um, and so you're a year into the game, uh, there's been kind of a set plan about let's get it to a certain point and then we'll maybe we'll evaluate. We'll see how's this um, extremely realistic, um, horrifying insect food peeling game where you manipulate the village. Let's check in and see how that's going. Um, and then uh, there's kind of like, a OK, parts of this are really cool. Parts of this aren't working um, quite like we hoped. Uh, is that the is that is that a point where you start thinking more about who specifically is in the village? Uh, is that a point where you start thinking about okay, um, are, are we are we pulling the player off of rails, or does that come later still? Um, that all yeah, that was around that time when we when we found that uh, the way it was wasn't really working. Uh, we made just a, a series of very drastic changes to all the designs. Uh, one of the biggest things that we tried to accomplish back then was that the there was a deep separation between the part where you're in town and the part where you're out hunting bug snacks, and we wanted those to be more connected. Uh, and so that kind of brought about like um, also that we didn't like that the game was on rails. So the feedback was like, all right, so take it off the rails. Let us wander these environments freely. Uh, same premise, throwing traps out in order to catch the bug snacks, but uh, that was actually surprisingly easy to do. Uh, that change. Well, yeah, I mean that that opened up a lot of possibilities because it turns out if you're trying to like lay down traps or do like elaborate uh, interacting contraptions while you're moving away from them, <laughs> it doesn't that doesn't really work right like like pokemon snap works because you're kind of just doing one thing you're, you're pointing and clicking uh so yeah it, that allowed us to but and and if, uh, we slowly like developed this uh, 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 this goal of having the pacing of of the game be like relatively slow and um I don't know how successful we were at this, but there was always a push to have it be observational and planning oriented rather than sort of like reactive and action. -y. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it did land in a place where there's there's kind of a 
a, a kind of hunter gatherer kind of like stop and wait for this thing to happen kind of vibe to it, as opposed to like, uh, here's arcade shooter moments. Um, but I, I guess I'm curious where that impulse came from. Cause I think for, um, for game designer, that, that feels like another risk to take on is like, Oh, what if in parts of the game, you don't do anything. So I <laughs> like, did that come from, um, and obviously it's worked very well. So I'm curious if, did that come from a, um, like, was that just a, um, an innate desire for kind of an interactive experience type of thing? Or was that sort of like a story thing? Like, you know, you're, we want people to be in a mindset where they're stopping and looking around them and that's useful for X, Y, and Z. I think, uh, that one was definitely something I pushed for as far as like, uh, the more contemplative pace. Um, cause I, um, like I at the time was pushing us in the direction toward mystery um, mm. as far as like exploration and mystery, as far as your kind of tone and expectation going into the game. Uh, and I thought that contrary to the on the rails game, which was very twitchy uh, and reactive that, if you're allowed to explore freely, it would be good uh, to be more deliberate about the things you do. I, one of the, I, I remember now one of my biggest desires back then, and I had the same desire with the characters too, was I wanted individual bug snacks to matter to you. Um, mm. That I didn't want it to be that you were just scooping them up in big handfuls and like didn't notice or care what was going in your bag like you were uh, net fishing, right? Um, I wanted you to like have to look at and care about bug snacks because we're going to put a lot of effort into these damn things. So <laughs> you better appreciate their designs. Uh, yeah. And the, there was always kind of a, uh, I, I was always like not intentionally pushing, but I was always like kind of pushing against that as I was designing and building the various like contraptions. Like there was an early version where you, you like kind of attached the different tools and traps to each other. So I, I was like, oh, you got your your strabby in its in its hamster ball that you can control. And then you take like a cannon that shoots nets and you attach it to the top and you've got this like wobbly net cannon ball that you're rolling around and like shooting it at at bug snacks. And it's like, oh this is fun, but it it quickly makes all of the bug snacks kind of be the same. And there's some of those tools and traps end up being uh, imbalanced or too powerful. So, so mm. it, it, it would kind of ruin some of that, that uh, chiller sort of pacing. Uh, another thing that was beneficial, I think, um, of, do, of going this route is that we're coming from making Octodad, which because of the sort of like weird controls it was kind of a, a level playing field for people who like aren't familiar with, with just like standard gamer controls so the fact that we were coming from that to making more of like a a real video game that is like a first person <laughs> has somewhat s standard video game controls having it be uh yeah more slower more forgiving in terms of timing and things like that hopefully made it more accessible to to people who would otherwise be intimidated by the, the that sort of that sort of game yeah that makes a lot of sense to me trying to keep the keep the floor low for um you know people who want a mystery story experience and there's this other activity that you can do maybe that doesn't have to be exclusionary based on like how good you are at bayonetta or something like that right <laughs> um, that that makes a ton of sense to me i really i think it's it's um really marvelous that there's this um well i i guess like uh, i'm curious um uh, I've got a bunch more stuff I want to ask about, but there's something in here about um, taking like deliberate steps to have this um, kind of marriage between the tone of the gameplay and the tone of the story where um, you wanted, um, there's like an increasing interest in telling a story that has a mystery at its heart and um, having gameplay that uh, also is 
a little bit more contemplative and observational mm -hmm. um, and trying to deliberately have those things fit together. And I'm curious if that was something that kind of came about step by step or if that was sort of like a, uh, no, it's mystery story, mystery gameplay. I don't want to be in a article about ludonarrative dissonance or something, yeah. or is this, or did, was this really just an intuitive, like it's a game about looking for clues um, and, you know, you're, you're foraging, why not look for clues there too? Um, great question. Cause like the, the gameplay story connection is uh, hard to get right sometimes, but I think uh, similar to uh, my feelings about the the contemplation of the gameplay, like my desire for the characters was I also wanted them to be small and specific where I wanted you to care deeply about individual characters. And that was a problem I had with the more zoomed out, uh, like town management version of the game. Mm. But, and so in that sense, like kind of as I continue to ask the question, why do you care about this? Uh, like kind of uh, answering it by getting deeper and deeper into the situation at hand. Um, but so to answer uh, about where story and gameplay meet, I think that a lot of my process uh, is to write about the game that you're playing. Um, and so like, at, because I, I think that um, so much of the way the quests are designed and the way the narrative is designed are ways to encourage you to go explore the island uh, and to get you to look around the world by doing specific things and to go meet new characters. And so typically uh, the moment to moment of the game, I am just kind of responding to what the player wants to be doing at the time. Um, and like letting things unfold based on what you've just done recently, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, is that where you is that where you start to get this idea of like, everybody who lives in the village has um, kind of like been in a big tantrum and they've gone and locked themselves in their rooms and you're trying to get everybody to come down and have dinner. Um, uh, the player now suddenly is less in like a mad scientist role and a little bit more in like a, a sort of a therapist role or something. <laughs> um, is that when that started to come in? Uh, it actually took a little bit longer for that. Uh, like, I think it was a couple years later, John, let me know if that's right, that um, we didn't figure out until then that the player was a journalist. Like, for a long time, there was an open-ended question as to who you were and why you were doing any of this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, I think, uh, so, yeah, I think that's right. But the 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 idea of, I think as soon as you have, like, here's this, like, strange world where these characters... Um, or have sort of discovered it or it's like unfamiliar and there is is um and there is this this mystery i think like it it almost sort of like naturally follows that uh the sort of like or maybe it doesn't naturally follow and it's just because <laughs> jurassic park is so formative and <laughs> you know probably makes up like five percent of my brain uh the, this like, oh, there's like this explore. If you're not the center, and I I don't know why, but I think it's just more okay. So if if you want to have it be a a mystery, you can't sort of be the central hero because, and and it, uh, so this this idea of like oh, there's this intrepid explorer who you're following and you're trying to figure out what happened in this in this place. Um, I think that that showed up pretty early and then yes. i think sort of connected to this is also some of those earlier town management prototypes because one of the things that we looked at early on was uh viva pinata this sort of thing of like slowly building up uh, a, a community and then like new characters sort of wander in as it becomes a, a, a nicer uh place or more you know uh, gradually you build it up and it's more active and you know by the end it's just like flourishing little community that was that was there 
um, from the beginning, even before there were like real characters. But then, of course, having real characters who you care about makes that process of, of bringing a, a community together much, uh, much more compelling. Yeah, it's funny. I've, I've been thinking, I, I've been, I feel like I experienced the game a lot as kind of like a a noir Pokemon thing, but in a lot of ways, it's almost like if like it's like an Animal Crossing Godzilla movie or something, <laughs> where like there's you know because uh, you always have a you know, there's always a monster movie trope of like you need a there's needs to be a reason for somebody to be there and and they're trying to find out what's going on because the viewer wants to find out what's going on and so you often you so often have. Uh, you know, a junior scientist or a journalist or something in the picture, but I feel like they very rarely end up stepping into the role of kind of like a therapist for a monster community that then like <laughs> brings everybody <laughs> together. Um, and I'm, so I, I'm curious, like the, um, how, at what point, it sounds like pretty early, there was a notion about like, there's a goal of cooperation as opposed to like a goal of being like adversarial or, you know, kind of victorious. Um, and it was that just like a, is that a personal interest? Is that something that came from previous games? Is that, um, cause I think that's something that's kind of rare and, and a little bit non-obvious in terms of, you know, setting out to have a, a goal. Um, usually the goal is, you know, have the most, be the best, um, vanquish your foes, et cetera, et cetera. That's fair. Because certainly, like, in a creature-collecting game especially, um, it is about having them all and, like, beating everyone. But, like, you know, this... Uh, one of our primary desires as a studio is to um, make games that are unique and are not kind of relying on the existing tropes too heavily as far as, like, combat and platforming. We want to come up with our own particular ways of doing things, which is a nightmare sometimes, but also <laughs> I think produces unique results. And so like, I just like as a, a company, I think we trended away from anything that involved fighting. Uh, mm. And so like naturally bug snacks was never gonna involve like a combat component with the snacks. Um, and I And I think maybe that's part of it then and because like this idea that bug snacks are parasites and bad mm -hmm. and you know there's also the and even though we we never really uh it took a, a, a while to to figure out the each grumpus has their own thing that bug their own special void that bug snacks are trying to to fill um, the, the like consumption isn't bad racking up points, capturing and feeding everything being like, not that I, I feel like that's just like a, there's some sort of intuitive understanding, maybe just on, on our team in general that like, oh yeah, this like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's <laughs> like, it's, it's, uh, common knowledge enough that there's something wrong with focusing on just mindless consumption that <laughs> and or, that we're not going to like do something that doesn't ex examine that i guess yeah i guess to me it's that we um like just from early on uh looking at the premise of our own story and thinking about the implications of it like even if we didn't set out necessarily with that theme in mind we looked at it and said that's the theme of that already <laughs> like <laughs> and we would you know, it would be uh, unwise of us not to explore that aspect of it. The parts that are kind of dark and upsetting about needing to catch them all. <laughs> yeah, I think right. I think also the moving, when the emphasis is, one, we can't, we're not going to treat the grumpuses like, uh, like robots that we're manipulating and we don't want to make it all about I mean, it's still there, but the, the all about catching them all, then that sort of leads us to, okay, I guess this is about the Grumpuses um, and their actual stories. Uh, so I think, I, I think it's kind of almost like a process of elimination <laughs> of removing some of these things that didn't work until we ended up on, 
on the, the mm. focus that did work. Yeah, there's almost like a, a once you've ruled out everything that's impossible, <laughs> whatever's <laughs> left, no matter how improbable, that's that's what you have to go with or something. Um, that's a good process. It does sound scary to me as, as a game developer also, uh, <laughs> but I'm really glad that you guys stuck with it. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to touch on before, um, uh, well, a couple more things, I guess. And don't forget, for anybody who's tuning in, um, feel free to leave questions uh, for us that we can um, hit up toward the end of this session. Um, but I was curious about also um, the... Uh, because there are things, I guess we've been talking a lot about like all the ways that Bug Snacks is like uh, uh, kind of breaking the mold or doing something unconventional within games. But there's a lot of things that I think are, are very conventional but are still um, very effective. Like the idea that you get um, you get upgrades and new equipment that help you explore the world. Um, but I think um, those things ended up also being uh, kind of connected to the story and to the characters and to especially this kind of like um, sort of... Uh, uh, tantrum-based diaspora of the characters <laughs> across the island. Um, but I think it's, I think it kind of like ties it together. And I, yeah, I was curious if there were um, anything about this process of like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna sprinkle these people. It's the people around the island and you're gonna go find them and they're gonna be focal to how you explore these regions. And then we're gonna connect, and then we can connect kind of like conventional markers of progress to those things. Um. It was a, an interesting process, and I know John and I talked about this the other day, that um, kind of the way it all shook out was that we had developed nigh 100 bug snacks in isolation, the 13 characters, eight biomes, and like six or seven uh, traps and tools, uh, all just kind of on their own. And then mm. that process was looking at the map and then just shuffling everything around like mad. Like we had a bunch of big meetings where we're like, what bug snacks go on the beach? What makes the most sense? Is it fruit? Is it all fruit? Like <laughs> what belongs in the mountain? What belongs in the desert? What character would most want to live here? Uh, like what to, what order do you want to get the tools in by difficulty and who makes the most sense to have it, right? And, and it took us a long time of moving things around and having very large disagreements <laughs> about the kinds of foods that exist um, that uh, we just kind of uh, shook through this process of like, all right, what kind of, if we move all these pieces together at the same time, what puzzle fits uh, and what will kind of give you the best like sort of pathway through the game? Yeah, we definitely didn't have any sort of like uh, genius game designer master plan, <laughs> right? Uh, because we never, we hadn't really built a, a systemic sort of game like this before. I think the only way that we could have managed to do any of this was to build all these little building blocks. Uh, and I think, yeah, I the, so. The, the two games that I was most inspired by in doing the the systems, the, the, the gameplay stuff were, and it's funny that these are both like big AAA things that are impossible to, <laughs> to achieve anything nearly, nearly like it, but Horizon and Breath of the Wild. So with Breath of the Wild being like, oh, this is amazing that this thing where all these you can do all these amazing creative things with these like little things that were clearly like built kind of in in isolation. Um, so it was it was like uh, both necessary and like the, the the way that we were inspired to to build things that it's like okay uh, let's just build this this uh, this particular bug snack and then figure out where it goes. Like, oh, it's fun to have something that picks stuff up and brings it to its nest. Or it's it's like, oh, this is kind of nice to have a bug snack that burrows and you got to figure out how to get it out or a bug snack that's really fast and you need some way to stop it. And then back and forth between, uh, going back and forth and, and sort of shaping the tools and the bug snacks and uh, against each other. And then that felt like, 
a little bit separate from the character and the level design. Yeah. I think uh, because that's, I guess that because Zune was responsible for the story and the quests and the levels. And I was responsible more for the bug snacks and the, and the tools. There's like a little bit more separation between those two things, but then within those, they were sort of cycling and, and influencing, each, influencing each other. Yeah. And I can speak, uh, even a little bit more specifically on character placement and how that kind of works dynamically that like oftentimes the quests were designed around the the bug interactions that were going on inside the level like i created quests to be like hey john made a really cool thing i want to make a quest where you have to do it <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise sure. players don't look at it uh but like uh but also um when we place the characters in the world uh, based on where we think they would go, uh, so much then of the story was written around where they had ended up. Where, mm. um, like, there are a lot of details that could have gone very differently if we had made a different decision about where they went. So, an example, like, a big example is like the fact that Wampus and Triffany were put in different levels despite being married. Mm. Like, because Wampus made most sense in the Garden Grove, because that he's got his farm there and I it, I thought it would be good to introduce him early uh because he can teach you about sauce uh, and that's like we are like you need to know about sauce as soon as possible it's extremely integral to the way the game is played so Wambus goes there to teach you about sauce uh Befica was there to teach you about the journal so they both needed to be in that level and we only ever wanted there to be two grumpuses introduced in a level at most mm -hmm. so it's like well he can't be with his wife but also, Triffany cares most about bones and skeletons. She should be in the desert where the ruins are. Uh, and then the story about the fact that they went to different areas because of their career differences is then written about that. Hmm. Right? Like the fact yeah. that we put them somewhere else. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. So there's um, a little bit of like, it, it sounds like the there's a part of the process that I've heard described as um, occasionally as like scatter and gather where it's mm. like, okay, we're going to go off, do a bunch of cool stuff, and we're going to bring it together and see what sticks, see what doesn't. But also, it sounds like maybe there was um, a certain amount of, uh, uh, so I guess, I, I think it's interesting because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of conventional wisdom about um, really digging into your story early and seriously to make sure that your story and your gameplay fit together. But I think you ended up, it sounds to me almost like you ended up in a scenario where you had like, um, characters and story were almost like a pressure relief valve for the way that you needed to spread out your gameplay elements in a way. Um, you were able to have some like wiggle room, like, oh, we've got, you know, um, we, we, we've left space, there's connections between the characters and those things are mm -hmm. maybe malleable in a way that, you know, the systemic interactions might not be. Yeah, I, I agree with that because it's my feeling right now in this moment that like, oh, I'm confident enough in the way the characters were written that they could have been any, you could have been introduced to them in any order and an interesting story would have happened. <laughs> uh, and and maybe it's my experience as like a role-playing game uh, master that I am used to improv a story based on what the players do. <laughs> right, um, right but where I feel like, oh, I think the scenario and the setup are strong and the details of it can go any given way. Uh, we, Cause like early on we had the outline of the story about the big beats about what would happen to the town over time. Like we know they're gonna come together and have a shitty party. Uh, Cause Philbo's not good at this. We know they're gonna get together <laughs> and like they're gonna, they're gonna see the monster. But how that actually played out could have been very different if we had made different choices. And I don't think I would have been dissatisfied with that. That's that makes... really interesting. All right. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys to do a different GDC talk later about <laughs> this kind of dungeon master mindset to like making, making these kind of um, modular is very much the wrong word, I think, but these flexible elements that can be sequenced and sequenced in different ways and kind of, um, remain kind of potent and interesting because that actually happens structurally in this game also like I think there's mm -hmm. a, a deliberate kind of opening up toward the end of the game where you do where you start to um, be able to branch out and experience the stories kind of in different orders a little bit too 
Yeah, mm. it's basically like once we're done teaching you new tools is when the player's allowed to just go wherever because you're, you're like, oh, you've got everything you need. You should be okay to explore now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, before I turn over and start scooping up some questions from uh, the uh, audience here, which we've got a bunch, um, my last question, I think, is kind of like... Um, Oh, how do you put this exactly? It's not exactly why bother, um, <laughs> it's, but it's it's sort of a little bit that, right? Like on some level, like, um, you know, an arcade game where you, um, you know, shoot critters and then feed them to people and there's like a town simulation, like um, that still totally sounds like a game to me, but it, it also sounds like there was like a kind of like an intuitive dissatisfaction with that as kind of like a creative undertaking for a group of people. Um, and I was curious if y'all had any final thoughts on um, that piece of the project. Because to me, it, from the outside, at least, that seems like something that's fundamental to digging into something that has these ambitions um, with a team the size that you have uh, and exploring the subject matter that it explores. I can answer first if you want, John. Yeah, go for it. Uh, my uh, my feelings are that I think it could have worked as a game and that we just weren't able to make it at the time. Like it, mm. maybe it was too high scope for us. Maybe there were too many unanswered questions at the time or it wasn't exactly going in the direction we thought. But I do agree that it uh, it could be a viable idea. So maybe it's it was too... Because it's funny, because I feel like where where the game ended up is something that strikes me as very ambitious. But maybe the what it was shaping up <laughs> to be initially was even more ambitious in some ways. That is accurate. <laughs> yeah, I, right. Because we were, um, you know, there there have been these ideas floating around of, of like trying to make storytelling more dynamic and. Uh, improvisational right with like oh here's characters that maybe their personalities aren't changed by what by what food bugs they eat but where like a character's attitude towards or your interactions with other characters influence how they're going to react to a you or a situation having you know basically having interactions between you and other characters that, that feel dynamic and and alive that's like a thing that people have, i feel like have been talking about trying to do for a while, but uh, maybe haven't totally achieved yet. So, like that, that like uh, systemic sandboxy sort of sort of thing. Like, could someday by someone <laughs> be accomplished in a way where those characters feel real and and um, and compelling, but. Uh, we we couldn't do it this time. <laughs> uh, well, I think I think to me it's, it's such a funny way to describe it because I think you did end up with a game that it has these really strong, interesting systemic elements, and you have these characters that are really believable and relatable, and that's done really specifically through thoughtful combination of like traditional storytelling techniques and kind of traditional scatter and gather prototyping techniques. Um, and I just think it worked. Uh, I think it worked really well. Well, thank you. I'm glad you guys stuck with it, even though it sounds kind of scary to me. Um, I guess that's how I always feel about games. And I'm not going to draw any tenuous metaphors between like uh, not knowing the player's role in the game, why they were there or why they were doing what they were doing for a long time. And us as developers often sitting with our projects, also not knowing who we are or what we're doing for a long time. I mean, there were long periods where it definitely, I mean, you know, middle of development is just sort of, it's easy to just kind of be stuck meandering around, not knowing, like I definitely was lost in <laughs> for about a year in there. Uh, trying, you know, like I'm fiddling with all these toys and trying to massage them against each other, but I don't know what I'm doing at all. Um, <laughs> and I think that didn't mirror like figuring out who the player is and like really solidifying like the, the ending of the game and what it 
was about uh, direct. Mm. It, at some point, it kind of like shifted from the gameplay and system stuff shaping and influencing the 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 story and characters, and it just slowly, I guess, as we got to know and and care about the characters and like the the themes and story that we like had no idea like it wasn't there at the beginning and then as we got closer to the end of development and things started to, to focus in it it shifted over to to that and that made it clearer yeah it's interesting because that's something that i feel like we see a lot um on our side as as developers also is this um uh thinking like because like uh you can talk about this game like, oh yeah, we knew up front, bug snacks, they're bugs, they're snacks, secretly they're bad. And it's all about, you know, how the characters deal with that. Um, but like, and that feels like knowing all the important things in a way. Um, hmm. And it's like, I feel like a lot of development often is figuring out, oh, that wasn't any, we didn't, that's nowhere near enough. That's like, that's not enough to hang a thing off of. That's not enough to make decisions about um, and like digging into it, um, which I think you you, um, you and the whole studio just did uh, such a wonderful job of doing. Um, so we're under 10 minutes left. We're actually technically under nine minutes left. I wanna get to some of the questions that came in from the audience. Is this a good time to do that? Uh, sure. Okay. All right. So um, top voted question is um, specifically about the snacks. What was the design philosophy behind the snacks? Um, did you have rules for what could or couldn't be a snacks? Um, we talked about this a little tiny bit at the start about how um, one thing the snacks can't be is viscerally horrifying and then <laughs> um, something that you physically um uh, uh, tear apart with your hands as a player, um, but uh, were there other guidelines that settled into place over the course of development? Well, I know at one point we had a spreadsheet where we were like trying to get, we wanted a, a, a large variety of foods. Uh, we also wanted to like represent a lot of different bug, you know, very loose definition of bug. So insects and other, you know, uh, other arthropods basically. Um, so we, and sometimes uh, just invertebrates. Right. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I feel like there's one other dimension that we are trying to balance other than food and, and snack. I mean, on top of that, there's like, Oh, we need, sometimes like, oh, we just need a care, uh, we need a bug that flies in this level. And we don't know what, we know the biome and we know the behavior, like what, what food, what bug. Uh, I'll, I'll also add one of our guidelines uh, for, but for what doesn't count as a snack, because we have many things that shouldn't be snacks, but are, but the real and true limit was it cannot just be an animal carcass. <laughs> Oh, sure. Like, uh, well, because well, there were a couple of times where like, oh, like a baked salmon. I was like, oh, no, don't just make it a fish, <laughs> right? right? Like, like because if it's already a different animal and you can see that it's an animal, how is it also a bug? That was kind of the question. Yeah, well, I feel like like anytime it comes close, like I, I, I have fond memories of some of the, sometimes the in-game script sort of like engaging with that. Like Ribblepeed, I think, has a little bit of special dialogue about like, oh, these bones aren't crunchy like bones at all. And um, <laughs> which, true. again, deeply disturbing observation to make. Soft all the way through. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <Love> that's horrible. <laughs> I, I love to sprinkle the underlying horror of the world into just random dialogue. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, as, as like fun and accessible as we want the game to be, we got to maintain that a little bit of that horror edge. I think it ends up being, it's, I think it ends up being one of the things that makes the, the basic moment to moment gameplay feel a little bit tense sometimes, but I think it also ended up being great building blocks for the ending of the game, which um, we could do a whole separate one hour session about probably. Um, but I wanna move on to next question. Um, this question is um, also from Megan Tankersley. Um, which is, uh, was the size of the island driven by scope? Uh, you have a lot of the kind of like basic biomes there were there, um, and also were there environments that you really wanted to include, but, but weren't able to. You talked a little bit about this being kind of a scatter and gather, like go off and 
make some environments and we'll, we'll, we'll staple them together later kind of approach. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to get into that a little bit more, that would be great. Um, yeah, I feel like we just, didn't we just sort of pick eight as the number of levels, <laughs> like two levels per biome was our thought. Yeah. And I, w one thing that comes to mind is that we, we, uh, tried to do like or thought about doing twists on the sort of standard biomes. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we're going to do like a, a black sand beach instead of a regular beach, but tried tried a few different versions of that. And it's like, this just, it doesn't look right. Yeah, it just uh, looks so, like dirt. <laughs> yeah, so we eventually, you know, we're doing a, enough weird stuff that this is one of the things we're like, we're going to lean into the conventional. Like we, we purposefully for a lot of the stuff that is very conventional, we're like, let's not try to reinvent the wheel with this. That goes for like UI and a bunch of other uh, things too. But, mm. but um, for the, the level, the biomes are like, let's just go, stick with the classics. Yeah, we uh, could do lava level. We can do ice level. It's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's interesting. I, I think the, um, I know uh, I, I'm just remembering several several discussions that we've had um, on our design teams about like where how how fun is it for because you can make something different for the sake of being different. You can make something different because you want to because you've already seen it a lot of times in games. But like, is it actually fun for it to be different? Is it actually fun for it to be stink? Like, is that part of the fun of going to the area? Is whoa, I've never seen this kind of beach before. Um, and is that done through the color of the sand or is that done through this beach is populated by terrifying food parasites with very cute eyes? Uh, uh, and, and the part of the question about the size of the, of the island, um, I think that kind of comes from the thing that Zoom was talking about earlier about wanting to care about the bug snacks and not just have it be you're scooping up a ton of bug snacks. Like my MMO poisoned brain always wanted everything to be bigger uh, and there's way more bug snacks. Uh, but like there's like a cozy sort of small manageable, like you can get familiar with this, this kind of comfortable in some ways size place mm -hmm. that, that I, I think ended up fitting the, the tone of, of the game better as well as supporting that that feeling of like oh there's only a couple of this bug snack in this yeah. world at any given time and they feel a little bit more special and then the size of the space just well that. yeah and and part of that related to that kind of the sizes that i tended to go with were built around the fact that bug snacks are very small like a, a big horizon zero dawn giant open world makes sense when your monsters are the size that they are but for us because bug snacks are so little and you need to be able to like watch and catch them. Like if the environment is turbo huge, like they get lost in it and we don't have the optimization to put a hundred of them in a jungle and be okay. <laughs> but, sure. um, yeah, but yeah, so, so small and dense, I think was the guiding line on that. Uh, I feel like it, it works. One of the reasons I think it works so well too, is you have this, you, you want to all for all the reasons you were talking about before wanting to put the player in a, in scenarios where they can wait and watch and grab something mm -hmm. um, kind of implies in a lot, probably not um, for me, it wouldn't have been obvious, but I feel like in retrospect, it sort of implies like, Oh, you need to be able to know where to go do that. Mm. You need to feel confident that you can like go up here, up the ramp across the thing um, past this, like very, what appears to me to be like a really carefully placed landmark uh, uh, over to this area because I know this is where they're going to be and I can hang out here and I can wait and watch and I can do, you know, the main thing that I do. Um, we've got just one minute left. Um, so this is a bit of a, uh, that is not enough time to address this very good question, but um, did you have a favorite villager um, in terms of getting to make them and find out who they were? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, well, and, and also, I guess, um, uh, just in general, how did you feel about how players reacted to the, the characters that live in the, in the village? Um, the answer is, uh, yes, I do have a favorite to, well, I guess there's a difference between favorite to write and favorite to like understand and explore. Cause my favorite character to write is Chandlow. Cause I could just. <laughs> Chandlow is my favorite character just because I, 
<laughs> I identify with him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he borrowed some of John's personality traits, but uh, uh, to oh. explore, I feel like um, I had a really interesting time. Uh, I don't know. I had an interesting time exploring all of them. That's what I. That's what I liked about that process. So I can't really pick one of them for the exploration. But uh, wait, what was the second half of that question? <laughs> Um, it was, how did you feel about players' reactions, but we're also out of time. So uh, if yeah, you have a one-word yeah. answer, that'll be great. <laughs> thumbs uh, up, thumbs down. Surprised, mostly. Huh. Awesome. Uh, anything, John? No, I'm good. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you both so much. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here. We went only a tiny bit over time, which for me is a effing miracle. Um, thanks y'all for tuning in and um, listening to us um, chatter about this game. If you haven't gotten to spend time with it yet, somehow apologies for spoilers. And I strongly encourage you to go check it out. It's beautiful. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.